Welcome, lovers of God. Faith, hope, and love. You are the best. This is the first Sunday of Lent, the gospel reading. It comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 4, and it raises a really good question. What could you do with 40 days? Really a better question. What might God do with you? What might God do in you? What might God want to do for you in 40 days? And I think as you study this passage that we're going to focus on this evening, you'll discover you're going to be really surprised at the answer. I'm Alan Hunt. I'm your guide into the deep mysteries, the rich beauty, and the life-changing inspiration of Scripture. Uh, Scripture has changed my life in ways I cannot, cannot even begin to explain. It's a marvelous, beautiful mystery. And I'm convinced that every time you study Scripture, you grow one step closer to God. This is really good stuff uh, that we're going to be jumping into. So if you're watching on the replay, welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching live, fantastic. Glad you're a part of this. You may be doing it as a small group that discusses these things together. You may be doing it on your own. No matter what you're doing, I'm glad you're here. Share it with your friends. Let's jump right in, lovers of God, shall we? What God can do in 40 days. You're going to be amazed. comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And as I shared with you, this is the reading for Sunday Mass, the first Sunday of the Gospel, I mean, the first Sunday of Lent. It's a very familiar story. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit for 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. Wow. You don't even have to go much further. That's one and a half verses. Hear that again. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the, from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit for 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. So he returns from the Jordan where he's been baptized. Remember, the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit sends like a dove as he's being baptized. Remember, he's praying. Um, the Holy Spirit is speaking behold beloved son. And he ate nothing in those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority in their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will give his angels charge of you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Love that last bit. He departed from him until an opportune time. You'll notice we won't go into this tonight, but you'll notice that at the end of the gospel in, I think it's chapter 22, Satan, it says specifically in the gospel of Luke, Satan enters Judas, who then betrays him. So Satan waits until that moment, that opportune time and prays on Judas and uses him. So Satan is waiting to attack Jesus just as he's waiting to destroy you and me and to lure us away from the ways of God. What I want you to notice, there's two or three really powerful, powerful insights in this gospel reading tonight. And I want you to, to notice in particular the role of the Holy Spirit in the gospel of Luke. It's amazing how much how Luke starts this whole story of Jesus, how and how he weaves in the Holy Spirit driving this whole thing all along the way. And so let's build up to the temptation story. Go back to Luke chapter 1, verses 35, verse 35. You remember this? This is when the angel Gabriel is speaking to, to Mary, uh, the Blessed Virgin, and letting her know at the Annunciation that she's going to be carrying the child, the Son of God. And she says, How, how's that going to happen? And this is what the angel Gabriel says to her. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called the Holy, the Son of God. So Jesus is conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. Then skipping to chapter 3, verse 22, and this is at the baptism that I just mentioned to you, the baptism of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form as a dove, and a voice came from heaven. 
Thou art my beloved son, with thee I am well pleased. So the spirit is present when Jesus is conceived. The spirit is present when he's baptized. Keep going to chapter four, which is where we are tonight. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. That's an important verse. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit and he is led by the spirit. So he mentions the Holy Spirit twice here in chapter four, verse one, to start this story of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days and nights in the presence of Satan. He's full of the Holy Spirit. Because right before this, in chapter 3, verse 22, the Holy Spirit's come upon him in bodily form in that dove. And he has been formed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. And so he's full of the Holy Spirit. And then he's led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by Satan. Think about that. The Spirit is driving this. Okay? Satan's not in control here. The Holy Spirit is in control here. And the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness so to be tempted by Satan. The the temptation. Verse 13, the very next thing, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. So after Jesus endures the temptation from Satan, he's nourished by the Spirit, and then he's led by the Spirit back into Galilee to begin his ministry, to begin healing and teaching and preaching and, and loving and sharing with people. So the Spirit is fully in control here. At Jesus' conception with Mary, at Jesus' baptism, and the temptation of the wilderness, and as Jesus begins his ministry. And then finally, the, when he goes back into Galilee, chapter 4, verse 14, then the very first thing that he does is he goes uh, in, into Nazareth, in his hometown, he goes into the, into the synagogue, and he takes out the scroll from the prophet Isaiah, and he begins to read, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So you see what Luke is doing here. As he, as he introduces Jesus in these first four chapters, from the Annunciation to Jesus, at Jesus' conception to his baptism, to being driven into the wilderness to be tempted, to then going into Galilee for his public ministry, to then reading from the, from the prophet Isaiah. As Jesus begins his ministry, begins his public life, the Holy Spirit has been present and saturating him and saturating this and is driving the agenda. This is not just something happening in history. This is the Holy Spirit driving all this uh, to be. Now, why does that matter to you and me? Well, it's a big deal. Here's why. Um, because notice there in chapter four, the, the gospel reading this week, twice in verse one, it says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So Jesus is not going out there on his, on, on his own power or on, on human power. Jesus is not being left to resist Satan and resist evil just by his own willpower or by some other kind of strategy, some kind of psychological program or what have you. Right? No, there's something far greater here. The presence of God, the Holy Spirit, is offered, available, and effective. That's what sustains Jesus in the wilderness. And that's really important for you and for me, because let's be very, very honest. You and I are going to be tempted. You and I are going to struggle. There are times when Satan is going to look for that opportune time, just as he did with Jesus. If Jesus wasn't exempt from Satan, if Jesus wasn't exempt from temptation, how could you and I possibly think that we will be exempt from that? And Lent is a really, really good time to remember that. We'll get into that more in, in just a bit. But the point here that Luke is making is that the presence of God, the Holy Spirit is offered to you. Don't feel like you're resisting temptation on your own. The Holy Spirit is being offered to you. The Holy Spirit is available to you. The Holy Spirit is effective. There is no better way to resist the power of evil, to resist temptation, than to draw on the Holy Spirit in our lives. How do we draw on the Holy Spirit? By studying the gospel like we're doing right now. How do we draw on the Holy Spirit? Through a deep prayer life, just like you and I are talking about regularly uh, in this Bible study. How do we draw on the Holy Spirit through the sacraments, the sacrament of the Eucharist, as we take Jesus into ourselves and we are surrounded by the Holy Spirit, allowing that Spirit calling on him because he's being offered to us, he's available, and he's effective. Now, second thing I want you to notice as we think about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, first is that is that power of the Holy Spirit. The second is, I want you to notice the pattern in Scripture of the 40-day, the four, what I call the 40-day pattern. Think back to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, and this happens several times in the book of Exodus. I'm, I'm only picking one tonight. 
And he was there, this is Moses, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote upon the, the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So when Moses is receiving the word of God, when he's receiving the commandments of God, he's receiving the, the, the covenant. He's on top of the mountain with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, fasting. See that? I mean, it, so any, any Jew who's reading this um, Gospel of Luke reading, would have recognized, okay, Jesus is, is, is following in this pattern of Moses, 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God, fasting and praying, seeking, listening. Same thing happens to Elijah, another great um, Old Testament Hebrew Jewish prophet in 1 Kings chapter 19. And Elijah arose and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Elijah has, has a meal. And then he goes and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights as he goes to the mountain that, that God's calling him to, Mount Horeb, um, to, to listen and to, and to, and to um, be in the presence of God. So this 40-day pattern that's consistent with, in these great stories, particularly of the great uh, leaders, Moses and Elijah, those are going to be echoing in, in the head of any Jewish reader of the Gospel of Luke as they hear this. They're going, okay, this is very much like Moses. This is very much like Elijah, 40 days fasting, uh, praying in the wilderness. And you even have the, the 40 days uh, to a lesser degree in the story of, uh, of Noah, right? In Genesis chapter 7, for in seven days, I will send rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This is God speaking to Noah. And every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. So Moses is, I mean, so Noah's being instructed by God to build the ark and then to take all the living creatures onto the ark uh, and then to stay put for 40 days and 40 nights. So there's something powerful. There's something spiritually rich about this 40 day pattern. Noah, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And so as you and I begin Lent, the 40 days, not counting Sundays leading up from Ash Wednesday to Easter, there's a reason for that 40 days. There's a reason why it's 40 days. It's built on this 40-day pattern of Moses, Elijah, Noah, and Jesus. There's something spiritually powerful and dynamic about that 40-day pattern. So much so that even when you go into Deuteronomy with, with the people of Israel, check this out. Um, this, is, well, this is Moses um, speaking to the people of Israel, and he says, and you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord." So here, instead of 40 days, it's the 40 years. At the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, you remember the Israelites are, are, have left Egypt? Moses' leadership to them, they, they, they continue to grumble and moan and complain and murmur. And, and God lets them wander in the wilderness for 40 years before he takes them into the promised land. You remember? And as they're um, perched on the precipice or they're, they're perched on the edge of getting ready to go into the promised land. Moses reminds them of this. He says, we've been out here for 40 years. Now it's not 40 days, it's 40 years. And what's God been doing? He's been testing you. And that's what happens to Jesus in the wilderness. He's being tested by Satan. He's being tested um, and, he's be, and he's learning to resist through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of God. And notice down here at the bottom, you see the, 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 where Jesus echoes the words here from what Moses tells the people, you know, God fed you with manna because, and you didn't know what was happening because man does not live by bread alone, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord, which is exactly what Jesus says to Satan when Satan tempts him to turn the stones into bread. Jesus draws on Moses. So two important things there. One is that a Jewish reader immediately reads the story and recognizes Moses, Elijah, um, Noah and the people of Israel. There's something, you know, the, the, the power here of the four. 
why Lent is so powerful for us is that it's built on this biblical pattern of the 40 days and what God can do when we really make ourselves available to him and fast and pray. Uh, and in our case, fast, pray and give alms. Uh, I, I love this this old um, painting um, from Salvador Dali. I think I've shared with you before. He's my favorite painter. And this is one of his um there, there, Michelangelo had a painting of the of the tempting of Saint Anthony. Um, many many painters. The, the story of Saint Anthony leaving his riches and moving into the desert in Egypt has inspired um, artists and, and Christians for almost sixteen seventeen hundred years now. But this is this is Saint Anthony, Saint Anthony of the desert, um, and this is him down in, in the bottom left corner as he's going in in the wilderness um, to be tempted. And going into the desert, and he's all he's armed with is the cross. And here's all the caravans of temptation and all the caravans of the cares of the world, um, voluptuous women and opulent wealth and all the temptations of the world. They're luring him in the desert uh, to, to not leave behind his old life of being wealthy and having a comfortable life, to, to, to not give himself completely over to God. And so there's, there's something about that going into the desert. And being armed only with the presence of God, Jesus is obviously is, is God. He's surrounded by the Holy Spirit. You and I have that Holy Spirit made available to us. It's offered to us, and it's effective. The Holy Spirit is effective for us. And th there's something powerful about this 40-day experience that what you and I are embarking on in Lent can be and will be if we actually draw on that Holy Spirit and really apply ourselves to it. So, again, the Holy Spirit. As you and I go on these 40 days uh, of Lent, we don't have to resist evil on our own. The presence of God in the form of the Holy Spirit is offered to you and me. The Holy Spirit is available to you and me, and the Holy Spirit is effective. That's what Lent is about. As we pray, as we fast, as we give alms, which are sort of the three traditional Catholic devotions or the Catholic um, mechanisms or, or, or applications for really pursuing Lent with vigor and with intentionality, uh, how are you going to pray differently to draw on the Holy Spirit? How are you going to give differently? And how are you going to fast differently? Doing extra things. Sometimes we think of it as giving up things. I would also encourage you to think about taking on extra things, taking on extra prayer, taking on extra giving, taking on extra fasting to draw on that Holy Spirit, because that's how we learn to resist temptation and to really prepare ourselves from Ash Wednesday so that when we get to Easter, we would have our best Easter ever. Because notice what Satan is doing in this, in this story with Jesus. Satan is um, tempting him with the cares of the world. All, all he's doing is saying, Jesus, I want you to acknowledge my legitimate authority, my legitimate dominion in the world. It's all about me, because Satan is all about getting, getting my way, um, getting what's mine, getting all that I can, getting even, getting while the getting's good, getting what I want out of life, getting, 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 getting. We, we live in a culture that's all about getting. And what we discover is that Jesus is not all about getting. He's all about giving. He says, if you want to gain your life, give your life away. If you want more love in your life, Give, 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 give love away. And so that's what's really going on in Lent for us is that this is a time to um, really recognize that if Jesus is not exempt from temptation, if Jesus is not exempt from struggling against evil, you and I certainly are not going to be. And those of us who feel like we're committed to the way of God, we're going to experience more forcefully the struggle with evil. I, mean, I think about St. Teresa of Avila, my favorite saint. Um, this is what this is. Her insight that the closer you get to God, the more you're going to struggle with the presence of evil, the more you're going to struggle with evil and, and, and try to resist that. Because what happens is as you get closer to God, First of all, you're more aware of how sinful you are. 
And so, and so the, the sin, the, the, the easy sense have already been burned away as you get closer to God. But as you get closer to God, the ones that remain are the ones that are really deeply embedded in you, embedded in you, the ones that you're really, really tempted by. And those are very, and for you, maybe it's pornography or, or for you, maybe it's uh, substance abuse or for you, maybe it's, uh, it's anger for you, maybe it's uh, being a shopaholic, whatever it is, that, those things that are deeply embedded you, that you have a hard time um, releasing and having burned away that you keep lapsing back into. It becomes more and more difficult the closer you get to God, because those are the only sins that remain. And, that, and it becomes more and more painful. The other reason why you're going to struggle with evil more the closer you get to God is because Satan's paying more and more attention to you. I mean, if you're out here just kind of frivolously dabbling in your spiritual life or ignoring your spiritual life altogether, Satan doesn't really have to do a whole lot. You're distracted by the cares of the world. you got all kinds of stuff going on. He doesn't have to pay attention. But somebody who's really trying to drive into the heart of God, who's really trying to um, have, have their sins purged away and develop a holiness to really become the best version of themselves, to really become about giving rather than getting. Satan is particularly active there to try to draw you back, to try to lure you back, to try to attack you. And so Lent is that reminder that God is making himself available to you in your praying, in your fasting, in your giving. He's making himself available to you in your scripture reading. He's making himself available to you in the sacraments to fortify you against, just as Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit, God is making himself available to you in the Holy Spirit to resist temptation, to resist the struggle with evil. That's what that's what Lent is for. That's what it's about. I mean, it, it's about giving rather than getting. And it's always amazing to me, the people who get this versus the people who don't. I remember reading about a guy named Matt uh, who lived in Detroit. And when I read about him, he was 78 years old. He was a forklift driver. Been a forklift driver for almost his whole life. And even at age 78, he was still driving that forklift. And he lived in a very little simple one-bedroom apartment in Detroit. He drove an old Ford Escort, um, and he didn't take vacations, and he gave all of his money away. At that point in his life, he had given over a million dollars. A 78-year-old forklift driver had given more than a million dollars to his parish, to, his, to church ministries, and to scholarships for kids. And people asked him about that, and he said, yeah, big house, big car, that doesn't excite me. Giving is my joy. He gets it. He gets it. Satan is all about getting. Jesus is all about giving. And Lent is this marvelous time for you and me to, to reorient ourselves. And if you look around your, your life and you look around your parish and you look around your community, there's all kinds of people who get it. You find um, a woman who's leading the teenagers uh, at your parish to, to give her faith away. You, you find the three business leaders who pull together each year to take a group to Honduras to serve the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, giving themselves, giving their, their love and their faith away. You find men getting together early in the morning at the parish or, or at, at a fast food restaurant to meet, to, to pray together and to encourage each other, to, to, to share the faith together because they, they want to be about giving rather than getting. Using Lent, using the prayer, using the fasting, using the almsgiving to really drive into the heart of God. That's the goal. What could God do with you in 40 days? So my two questions for you this time, are first, what does God want to do in your life over the next 40 days? Not what do you want out of the next 40 days, but does what does God want to do in your life for the next 40 days? You're embarking on this great journey of Lent. What do you think God wants to do? Dream about that a bit. If you're doing this as a small group, whether live or on the replay, discuss that with each other. What what dream with each other? What does God want you to do? What, what does God want to do in your life for the next 40 days? And then secondly, what steps can you take to draw on the Holy Spirit when you're tempted? If you're doing this on your own, I invite you to keep a journal each week uh, during this Bible study to write down these questions and to reflect on them during the week as you prepare to go to Mass. What steps or what one step can you take to draw on the Holy Spirit this week when you're tempted? How can you do that? The Holy Spirit is making himself available to you. He's offering himself to you. He's available to you, and he's effective. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Luke is saturating this whole story in the Holy Spirit. Jesus conceived in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's tempted in the Holy Spirit. He goes into his public ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he says, the Spirit, upon the, Lord is, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. How are you drawn on that Holy Spirit? Discuss together. If you're on your own journal, pray a bit about that. 
because I pray that you'll have your best Lent ever. You see there on the screen, dynamiccatholic.com. If you haven't already signed up for our Best Lent Ever program, it's completely free to you. A short daily uh, video for each of the days of Lent, 40 days. Go to dynamiccatholic.com. Sign up right now for Best Lent Ever so that you are using these 40 days to their maximum capacity. Moses spent 40 days on the mountain. Elijah spent 40 days on the mountain. Noah spent 40 days on the ark. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. You're about to spend 40 days. Use them well. Use them wisely. Let me pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we love you. We offer these next 40 days to you, O Lord, that they might be something that you want in our lives rather than what we want. Help us to be givers rather than getters. Help us to draw on your Holy Spirit to become who you desire us to be, that we might indeed have our best Lent ever, and therefore our best Easter ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love you, my friends, and there's nothing you can